of the day, and as I mentioned earlier, we'll uh, finish each we'll finish each session with something of a technical nature. Uh, Dan Drake is interested in a lot of areas of mathematics, does a lot of things in the things in the Sage Library, but probably best known for his Sage Tech contribution. He is also the Southeast Asia representative to the Sage Project. East Asia. East Asia. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Don't Take it away, Dan. All right, so uh, the way I think of this, apparently in the 60s, IBM had this ad campaign where they said they were, their slogan was uh, something like, people should think and machines should do the work. And uh, the subtext, presumably, is that you're supposed to buy all these machines to do the work from international <laughs> business machines. Um, so, and I, I feel the same way. I hate doing the work. So I want the computer to do it for me. And a lot of times when you're writing something, you, you need to do some computation in your, your document. And I, I hate doing the computations and copying and pasting or, or just copying. So here's a, here's a real quick example of something you might want. Like uh, you're doing some discrete math class with your students, and you're looking at lottery tickets. How likely are you win to win the lottery? Uh, so I looked up the, the Powerball. You've got like five numbers which are between 1 and 59 and then you've got the Powerball which is between 1 and 39 and so you might tell your students well there's this many combinations and I don't want to figure it out so uh, you might write something like this the total number of Powerball lottery tickets is and I know it's 59 to the fifth times 39 actually that's not exactly true because the order doesn't matter but let's forget about that uh, but I don't want to copy I don't want to do that, I want the computer to figure it out for me. So uh, I want to write 59 to the fifth times 39 and have the computer just put it in my document for me. I want it to do the work. So let's see what happens when we typeset this. All right, so that comes up. So it seems a little disappointing at first. But I'm just I'm telling you about Sage Tech, so I've only done tech so far. So let's do uh, let's take a look here. So we'll get to the other files first. I'm doing file one, and I have the kind of normal uh, little bits and bobs that you get. Um, and then there's this file one dot Sage, which a smart person might just guess to do something like this. I, on OS 10, it's spitting out all these things about Sage 64, and it's, it's not doing anything. The, the, uh, the key thing is down here. Right, it tells you, yeah, I'm doing some Sage code for this thing. There's an inline formula. Oh, and then it tells you, uh, makes a little suggestion on what you should do. Here. And sure enough, it's done it for you. So there's. Now you can be happy. Now the computer has done the work and you're happy. So that's just the simplest basic idea. And uh, I told Rob earlier that if, if necessary, I could give about a five to ten minute version of the talk. And so if I had to stop now, that would actually be fine. So once you know this, where you type things in your tech file, typeset, run sage, typeset again. That's actually a very good start. But I'm going to keep us all away from lunch a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> I did look at the, uh, the schedule and I thought, oh man, I don't want to speak for lunch because everyone's going to sit there thinking, do I want to go for Thai or this? <laughs> Not pay attention to my work. So there's more things you can do. So along the way, you might want to talk about some, some Sage code. Uh, so here's an example. I uh, start off with the same little lottery ticket thing. Um, you put in all your normal LaTeX stuff. Um, I should, I should at least mention. Somewhere along the way, you have to tell LaTeX that you're going to use Sage Tech. And you do so in the usual way. So 
I want to show the reader some Sage commands, so I do this Sage block business, and then you just type exactly what you type in Sage. Uh, nothing special, normal sort of thing. So I blah blah blah. I set some equations and I solve them. Uh, and then the solutions here are uh, whatever that S thing is. So you have to maintain a little bit of LaTeX and a little bit of Sage in your mind. S equals the solve. All right, I want to see what that is. And we'll get to these other things. So let's just see what we get. <coughs> we have the same little question marks, because it still doesn't know, in this case, it doesn't know how many Powerball tickets there are. This business here, this is just tech putting it on the page. Uh, it's not doing any computations yet. And it doesn't know the solutions here. So let's go back here. This is now file two. Notice perhaps there's an inline formula, a code block, blah, blah, blah. And it says, oh, okay, I'm done. So let's go back here. And this is a lot better. It's replaced the solutions with the big list uh, and so on. Now, along the way, you may want to sometimes show people things that you don't actually want to execute. So here I have a pretty good example of something you don't want to execute. Uh, some large number. Factorial, 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 factoring that. Uh, I, and, and being very careful and conscientious, I marked it a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you're going to actually put whatever you want in here. So it, it, it never gets seen by Sage. So you can put silly things in there for whatever purpose. Um, so you notice over here in the typeset version, there's, it just goes from this thing to the next base six business, but in my uh, file over here, oh, and I should mention, that's a the first thing where you want things executed, or not executed, that's sage verbatim. Just like the normal verbatim environment, that's, that's pretty much what it is. So below that I have sage silent, so it's silent, you know, perhaps invisible or something like that would have been a better metaphor, but this jump. Is there a sage verbatim anything above the verbatim It's it's like this far away. There's a, a a little bit of indentation that it uses, and so if you use sage verbatim, it's guaranteed to be consistent. Um, and also, just semantically, it's it's marking up for you and any kind of fancy conversion things that this is sage code and not some other kind of code or, or something in my file. So certainly, if you want to use the verbatim environment, just go ahead. That works exactly the same. Um, so sometimes, though, you have kind of setup code that you need to do. You have to uh, do a bunch of computations and import some packages. And you don't want to show that to the reader. Uh, you can do things in a sage silent thing. So here I set. 59 to the fifth times 39 to the variable x. And I don't want to show that to the reader. And then down here, I put it in base 6 and base 11. And I can refer to that x. Um, and if you have display, don't display, execute it, don't execute it, um, that's four combinations. And the combination where you neither display nor execute um, is actually provided by something else. It's the comment environment. And you can also, of course, just comment on your LaTeX code like you always do. So, so is there anything that comment does that's different from just, just sound? Um, the only difference is that you don't have a bunch of percents in the, the beginning of the lines. So yeah, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> In, in tech terms, it, it, it just tosses it all. <coughs> oh, so this is nice. Um, but along the way, people say, well, OK, but I want some pictures. I want my pictures to just happen. I don't want to. I want the machine to do the work. So let's look at some pretty pictures. Um, so pictures are done. For the most part, with the Sage plot macro, 
Um, this gets more complicated because uh, the, the pictures are more complicated. You know, in LaTeX for your graphics things, you can scale them, you can rotate them. You know, there's all these things. So we need to tell Sage things and we need to tell Tech things. Because uh, what this is actually going to do is plot whatever with Sage, get a file, and then use the normal include graphics in LaTeX to display it to you. So we need to tell Sage some things and uh, LaTeX some things. And so the, the syntax gets a little more complicated. I'm not going to go into the details, uh, although it's easy enough to figure out from there. Uh, let's just see what happens here. Uh, now this actually fails, and I decided to leave it failing, at least initially. Uh, there's, there's some really nice stuff for plotting combinatorial graphs, uh, which requires some extra little add-ons to uh, TIC-Z, if you know about that graphical system in tech. Uh, so this is something that you may encounter if you say, oh, I want to make a really beautiful plot of this graph, and there's these TKZ verge and graph and guys. So you need to get them. Uh, let me do that now. Jason. Is the license on those files such that we should just incorporate them in the Sage tech test package so that it comes along with Sage and if you just make that yeah. part of your local? Um, I actually there. looked on the site and I couldn't really identify the license, but there were some other things that were LaTeX public license things on the site. So I decided to assume so and just include them. Oh, so you did include them? Yeah. Okay, I don't so know if it's in the most Sage. recent test package. Okay. So they will come with Sage, so we won't have to go find them and download them. So in this case, I'm just going to uh, So there they are. TKZ, a riff urge. You don't need to worry about those, except you have to make sure that tech knows about them. So go away. In this case, when, when you can't find the plot because you have not run Sage yet, um, I made up a little thing so it's got the question marks like before and it also has the little border so it's supposed to look a little bit like the, the traditional image not found things on uh, web pages. So uh, everything else seems to be working well enough. Let's go over and run Sage. interesting things here, perhaps not so interesting if you just want it to work. Um, it puts the plots in a special directory, um, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, it will try to save things in EPS and PDF format, those are vector formats, and they'll look a lot better. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work, and it has to fall back to just PNG, which is a, a bitmap format. If you zoom in, it looks, it looks not so great. The plotting thing I've tried to make really robust. Uh, let's take a look at the things it made. Oh, down here, there's this sage plots for file3.tech, and that's where they're actually stored in. So if you're working on something and you have some other graphics, uh, this will not hopefully not accidentally trash anything. Um, and it's easy enough to see, oh, sage made that, I can just delete it. All right, so let's see what we get for all that work. All right, so there it is. Um, it's rotated and scaled and blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot more here. So I have, I just plotted the sine function. I made a circle, and I put them together. Uh, it does that for you. Um, and so many times I'll plot a circle and I'll say, that's not a circle at all, it's a Sage program, it's got all sorts of bugs in it. And, no, it's that. But thanks to Ryan, that will finally be fixed, because he reviewed a patch that Jason and I wrote the answer for. Good. Excellent. So there's just your regular calculus-style graphs, and then you have more combinatorial graphs. Um, I don't know why it's overwriting the text nearby. 
that's what it's doing. At least you can see what's happening. Uh, so Sage computed this layout and it spit out all the information in a really nice format and then tech pulled it in and typeset it in this nice way. If you put that in the F-box, I'm curious. I'm curious if it's just looking at the centers of the vertices and laying out those or and ignoring you know, the Yeah, the it's, it's something that's fixable. Yeah, and I think actually we have seen the same plot in one of the workshops, and it also was kind of bigger than the space. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. okay, but right now we're not. Uh, we don't care if it overwrites some words. We just want to see the pretty pictures. Uh, 3D graphics are a kind of frustrating part of this. Um, so, in, in your tech documents where you're making PDFs, you want vector formats like. Uh, EPS, encapsulated PostScript, or PDF itself, um, because then when you know they're real high quality, it's a vector format, um, looks nice when printed, doesn't look pixelated or anything. But the 3D graphics right now, we don't have any good way of creating those things from from any of our systems. So it just defaults and falls back to PNGs, which uh, they actually they do look pretty good for most purposes. So. Um, it, it uses the, uh, the tachyon renderer, which you may or may not know about, um, and it creates pictures that look about like so. Uh, let me show you the... Uh, so let's see it down here. Uh, set up my variables, and then this is a little plot 3D sign of pi, blah, 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 blah. I scaled it down. Yeah. Yes. I think Tixie will produce certain diagrams as SVGs. Really? Nicely. I think that, that's what's happened in my experiments. I mean, almost by default. Interesting. I don't think I've made any SVGs with Right. Tixie. Maybe we can experiment okay. tomorrow and see if we can get a little testing going. Okay. Alright, so up until now, this is all pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, you know, oh, I have Sage, it, it, it computes things for me, it makes graphics. Uh, but the nice thing about this system is you can do other things as well. Um, so, this is actually, the, the stuff in here is actually what I used uh, Sage Tech the most for. Uh, so, you know about making tables in LaTeX. Um, and you have to put all the ampersands in. And, if, and I suspect this is the kind of audience that will all agree with this statement. I would, instead of spending 10 minutes typing ampersands, I would rather spend 45 minutes to an hour yeah. writing a function. <laughs> and then I justify it by saying to myself, but I'm gonna use this in the future. And so over, over the long term, this is gonna save me so much time. And and it's probably not true, but I'm willing to delude myself into thinking that way. And, uh, and I'm very happy in the end, so. Um, so what I've done here, so yeah, so if you, you want to typeset some kind of table, so if, if you just think in terms of Sage or Python, the data structure you want for that is a list of lists. So I don't want to type ampersands. I want to just make a list of lists and have the computer do all the work. I do the thinking to make the list of lists. The computer does the work. So this is one of those things where I sat down, I thought about how to do it, and I spent a long time uh, instead of just typing the stupid ampersands. Um, and this is a function here. It's in a sage silent thing, so I, I don't see it. It just gets executed later. Um, and I just made a function. And it just manipulates strings, really. Um, it just builds the whole thing. Gritty details are not important. It's just you give it a list of lists, and it gives you a big string. That is the, the tech code that you want. So you know, it's got a begin tabular, and then it figures out how many R's or L's or whatever it needs. And then at the end, for the purpose of an example, I have a little Pascal's triangle. And this is the kind of thing I like to do. List of lists, binomial MK for K and that's what I like. Right, 
Now there's a slightly new thing here. Up until now, I've just been using backslash sage, and that runs sage's LaTeX function on things. So um, if you give it an integral, if you do backslash sage, it will use sage to get out the backslash into whatever. Um, sometimes you don't want that. This is a case where I don't want any processing. I just want you to take the actual string I get from this and just plop it into my tech file. So you use sage string, sage str. All right, so let's... Well, it's still, it, the reason you had to do the sage string is because it's using the Python code that you wrote for yeah. the tech. Well, it's not that it's using the Python code. It's that if you, it's, the function is just giving you a string. And normally it will try to do LaTeX on that string. And that's not what we want. We want to just leave it alone. Okay, so, and we haven't run Sage yet. But you were a Python function to do it instead of a tech function to do it. Which in theory you could also have done. Yes, and if you wanted to write a tech function that automatically computes the tabular environment, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, I will use for loops and string manipulation in Python. <laughs> Thank you very much. I guess the other thing you could have done is you could make a sage object type, which is a sort of a tabular, and have its LaTeX, which is otherwise just a list of lists, but its, its LaTeX representation is this thing with the ampersand. Exactly. That's another route. Um, and there's, there's actually a couple of tricks you can do with those ideas, um, which maybe I'll talk about. So let's go back out of my way, typeset, and all I had to do is type binomial nk, really, and I get my lovely little tabular environment. Uh, so that's a, that's a favorite of mine. This is something we saw with Rob's talk. Um, so you you want to show people some some Sage code. Um, and you want to show them what you would type in. Um, but along the way, you wanted to spit out something that you can doc test. So um, I've created this function. Um, it does stuff, who really cares? Um, and maybe it's important for my document that over time, I make sure that this still works the way it should. Um, so let's see what we get. Um, there's a couple little strange things about this that take some explaining. So what you get typeset doesn't look very surprising. You know, it's the usual verbatim sort of thing for the function. Um, it did, notice this, it did typeset the uh, output in a really nice way. Um, that can be turned on and off, but that certainly looks nice. Um, one interesting thing is that what you put here, that's not what gets put into your final PDF or DVI file, um, and I'll show you. So let's put four there. All right, that stays the same. Let's say, oh, I'm going to run Sage. I'm going to be very careful about all this. Run LaTeX on your file again, it says. And notice over here, this is still one. We've run LaTeX a couple times, we ran Sage. So what Sage is doing here, it's actually running f of x and getting out the, the answer. Uh, it's not using what you provided. What you provided goes somewhere else. So let's look at the files we get. All right, so you get all this crap from LaTeX. You get this sync tech thing from tech shop. And then you have your sage file, which is what we've been running. And then down here, there's this doctest.sage. And I want to show you that for, for silly technical reasons. We can't do dot doctest, which I would prefer, but that's life. Um, and it's really, it's just a little tech file, or it's a text file. Perhaps you might say it's a Python file because it's in just one big triple coded string. Uh, and it just says, oh, it's auto generated, you can delete it. And it has all this in here. And this is exactly the format that Sage wants for doc testing. So you can just run sage t. 
And it runs the doc tests just like it always will. And they should fail. Um, yeah, I got plus one and you gave me plus four. So for long-term projects, you know, of course, if you're just writing something for your calculus students, um, perhaps, but probably not, you're, you don't need this. But for these textbook projects, for the, the lab manual things, long-term, you want to make sure that Sage and your document are, are cooperating. Um, and this gives you a nice automated way of making sure they cooperate. So that you can change it as soon as Sage changes. So, so the main point of the Sage example is the Sage block is it meets this doc test block. Yes. Right. Um, and under the hood, this has to work in a different way because it actually evaluates the things in there and replaces the outputs. The Sage block just typesets what's there. So it's, this is doing strange things, um, even though <coughs> in the PDF it looks about the same. Okay. But from our point of view, the main point to use it is because then you get the stock test. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. Perhaps it's bad form for a speaker to show his notes to everyone, but yeah, we messed up the doc test. Saw that. Um, there's a couple other things that run very much like this. There's a Sage command line. So this is, this is the idea. You want to show your students what commands you type into Sage to do some computation, but you don't actually want to copy and paste the output for your students. Because again, that's work. Um, the computer should do the work. And this Sage command line environment, which I'm not going to show you, actually does that. You just give it the inputs, you know, uh, integrate the function, integrate it again, find the Taylor approximation, and then it fills in all of the outputs for you. It does all the work. And it also uses a listing environment uh, so that it looks much better than a plain verbatim. Yeah. Uh, so I want to give you at least a little idea of how this actually works. Uh, so I want to go back over to all these these files that were made. And there's there's two that you need to care about. It's the .sage file and the .sout file. So what happens is when you first run LaTeX, LaTeX, along with all the other stuff, it writes out a the, the .sage file. And that's, it's it's a bunch of Sage source code. Uh, I think file three is, is interesting. So you can look at it. It's uh, you know, some of it looks a little bit goofy, but it's it's nothing too hard to understand. Um, it does some version checking. You can ignore that for now. And uh, you can see here some kind of inline thing. Run late the LaTeX function on two to the thirty-two plus one. Um, uh, plot. So this is oh here's the command. You do that plot. It's feeding it into some other function. So that's, that's doing all the plotting things where it saves files to a certain directory and so on. Um, the, the try and accepts are uh, catching errors so that if something, if you write some silly code in your tech file, um, you have some chance of figuring out what went wrong in there. So it's, it's just a Sage file. It's, in a, it's nothing you would write yourself, but it's, it's pretty easy to understand. Now, when you run Sage on that, Sage writes out a LaTeX file. So, uh, LaTeX writes a Sage file. Sage writes a LaTeX file. And uh, I was going to tell William that he should insert in the video at this point the uh, "Circle of Life" song <laughs> from the, the Lion King. <laughs> so, I'll show you the S out file. So here. We, we, we actually use labels for everything. So remember the 2 to the 32 plus 1? Here's what you get from that. It's making a label, and it's setting something that Sage Tech knows about. And there's the number, 429496, and so on. Uh, and then here's another label, which is much, much bigger. 
So it's this whole tick Z thing that has all these defined colors and blah, blah, blah. You can put anything you want in the label. Um, so it, it can be really big. And so uh, that's the whole thing that gets pulled in and it made that graph that overlaps some of the things. Uh, I'm going to show you one other, let's see here. File four, let's say just a little interesting. So here, this one, it just puts the function definition right in there. Uh, the little Pascal thing, and then it says, yeah, just take what you get here and uh, give you one. The doc test thing works a little differently. It puts in this big triple quoted string, so if you use triple quotes, it will uh, fail in strange ways. It uses that string to, and it takes it apart and reassembles it and does what you want. So there's a lot more you can do, uh, but my hope in this talk was to just show you the basics of how it works, and then you can go and read all the documentation. Um, the typeset documentation right now is 50 some pages, um, that includes all the source code. And so, um, along with the example file, that gives you a lot of ideas. And once you know the basic setup, it's all good. So that's Sage Tech. So if you do, you know, uh, well, here I'll So, um, oh, this is on the bottom, let's put it up to the top. So if you, you have your, your macro which spits out some stuff, you can do something like that. And yeah, tech before it ever ships it out to the Sage file, it replaces backslash foo with what you want. Okay. So you can actually mix uh, mix tech and, and Sage in a, that's, that's what seems like a strange way. Surely that doesn't happen in a Sage for beta. No. So yeah, you have to do it somewhere where where tech is going to okay. fit in with it. And use this to make a list where each row was x to the list number, x to the i or whatever, and the derivative. How robust are the Sage commands in LaTeX in terms of, like, with the, the, the picture that you had that was overriding some text, would you be able to put that inside of, like, a scale box or something? Yeah, that, that should work. If you, uh, I guess, how do you handle, if, if you had Sage code that did request for a three-dimensional graphic that rotated, um, does that just throw an error, or does that print a, the, a static image? It's going to do a static image. The, okay. the three-dimensional graphics that rotate, are you talking about like the JMOL applets? Yeah. Yeah. When, when Sage has a, a 3D plot, it, it decides on how it's going to show it to you. And it can use the JMOL viewer, which is what it does in the, in the notebook, but it can also use that tachyon viewer. Okay. So and it inside just, Sage Tech, it always... You know, it just forces the... Uh, even if you were to request for it to be a three-dimensional, like an interactive or something, it would just force it to be the static image. Yeah. Because we can't typeset job applets. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just uh, my only thought is that you can then just include all your files and then write everything once. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have a couple of questions. One is just a practical question. If I want to use Sage Tech today, is this is it is it already in the Sage install I have on my computer, and so I just have to tell my tech where where to find the files. 
Yes. So I, there's. I assume there's, there's, there's somewhere you can file that tells you how to do that. Yeah. Okay. I found that hard to use though. I mean, the moving the style files to the right place. I never quite know where to do it because there's so many tech shop. Yeah, it depends on your local tech install, I suppose. Yeah. I, mean, I, want, I, want to I was, I was just working on this yesterday, yesterday and sort of got it to work, but I haven't got it to work nicely yet, so I'm faced with the same problem. There's introduction or uh, instructions at www.sagemap.org slash docs slash installations mm -hmm. slash sagetech.html. Yeah. The underlying problem is that you have to do something with your tech distribution, right. and that's never easy, and yeah. we can't do it automatically. Right. So as far as I know, there's there's one irritating step that we cannot optimize away. And we have to be careful because the Sage Tech SDY has to match up with the Sage Tech PY and the Sage Tech in Sage, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so you, can't you separate don't, into you don't want to just copy the STY file and update your Sage. Yeah, so so, so you the solution is put the right link in right. Yeah, put, right a, put a symbolic link to the Sage Tech installation in Sage local share tech and that whatever. And so then it's always automatically using the right. There could one could write a script to help with that. Probably to help. Yeah, we wouldn't yeah. want to do it automatically. So I grab I grab Dan's you know tip of his distribution, and then I put the right piece of Sage Tech. I install it into my Sage version. So I do it backwards. I put all of his tech stuff into my local tech tree that I know how to do. I just park it in there, and then I grab the one Python file, or I, I do an easy install that pulls the right things out of his distribution and puts it into one of my Sage. Yeah, I might find that easier. Do I find that easier? Well, so, why so yeah, I have notes and it's a, it's, it's a one or two step thing. So I gave my Sage directory through a symbolic link in a fixed place and then I have my symbolic link in my tech match tree pointing to my fixed Sage directory is always going to point to whatever my current Sage is. And that's a set once and forget it and I never have to worry about it again. Add directories to where you look for smiles. Right. So it's like a, like a it's just a simple, and you can do that per user so that doesn't work. So they appear in there. That's almost part of the problem is that there's too many ways to solve problems. <laughs> and it depends on the system, right? And it depends oh, on the system. It would be so much easier if, they, if there was just right. one thing to do, because yeah. then I could tell people to do that one day. Did you talk about remote teching? <laughs> no. Okay. Because that's that's a. Is it broken currently? Probably. I think it works. I think we fixed it so it works. Really? Okay. Yeah. I have, okay. I have one other question. Sure. Uh, do I need to know anything special if I want to use Sage Tech with Beaver? Um, no. There's a couple tiny little things. Beamer will. You should do fragile. Yeah. Put the fragile switch. Yeah. Is it all documented in your. Yeah, it's, it's the, the main documentation for Sage Tech. Just search for Beamer. Okay. And there's like a t couple of tiny little things you do. Right. But basically, it's, it just works. On the wiki page, uh, there is actually an example of how to use it in Beamer. Okay. All right, thanks again, Dan. <laughs>